All right, so good evening. I'm Commissioner Rowe. I'm standing in for Justice Ross because he's unwell today. Um, now, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you on behalf of Justice Ross, President of the Fair Work Commission, to today's lecture and panel discussion, a part of the Commission's Workplace Relations Education Series. Since its inception in 2014, the series has featured mock hearings and lectures delivered in collaboration with universities and associations around the country. Today's lecture is being held in collaboration with the University of Melbourne and will be delivered by Anna Booth, Deputy President of the Commission. In addition to being a member of the Commission, Deputy President Booth is a member of the Advisory Board for the Work and Organisation Studies Discipline at the University of Sydney Business School. But more importantly, she's a leader in the Commission and in the community uh, in support of uh, interest-based uh, bargaining and interest-based approaches. And she's passionate about building trust and she's not, that's not trust in the sense of asking you to walk blindfolded over a cliff. It's rather <laughs> trust in the sense of uh, genuinely sharing information and understanding. And it's not the same thing, as I'm sure she will tell you, as a traditional approach to preventing and settling disputes, because it's much more about the quality of the outcomes and the longevity of the outcomes. Following, um, and so she'll be speaking about interest-based bargaining and the Commission's new approach as jurisdiction. More particularly, she'll be exploring the importance of trust in enterprise bargaining, as well as the way in which interest-based bargaining fosters trust between negotiating parties. Following her talk, we'll be joined by Kim Parrish and Angus McFarlane, who are sitting in front of me, who will provide us with an introduction to the House with No Steps experience of interest-based bargaining and problem solving. Kim Parrish is an Executive General Manager at House With No Steps, a leading disability service provider operating across Australia. She's a senior HR professional with expertise in developing HR strategy, leading learning and development and delivering business focused organisation change. And prior to joining House With No Steps, Kim worked as a management consultant and held leadership positions at Girl Guides Australia and in the UK at Northampton General Hospital and the Institute of Leadership and Management. And Angus McFarlane is an Assistant Secretary of the Australian Services Union, New South Wales and ACT Services Branch. Prior to being an Assistant Secretary, Angus was Senior Organiser in the Community and Disability Division of the ASU. The ASU New South Wales and ACT branch represents a diverse range of industries from public sector water utilities and transport to private sector airlines, travel and IT. And in his role as Assistant Secretary, Angus leads a team of organisers in the non-government, community and disability services sector. Following the case study session, Anna Chapman, Associate Professor of Employment and Labor Relations at the University of Melbourne, facilitate a, a panel session with our three speakers and you'll be invited to ask questions and engage in discussions with the panel. So uh, we'll start off uh, by welcoming President, uh, Deputy President Anna Booth to the podium. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Julius. Julius could um, equally, or indeed um, uh, superiorly, if that's a word, uh, be delivering this lecture because uh, he is uh, involved in a number of quite challenging new approaches activities, one with uh, um, a large uh, manufacturing enterprise in Australia called Aurora, which was uh, the Amcor fibre packaging business before it was uh, renamed, and also a more more of a household name, actually, News Corporation. 
so a number of us are involved uh, and, and all of us could equally be delivering this lecture, but I've just been the one who's luckily been chosen. But it's very much a team effort uh, because um, with Kim and Angus's contribution, um, we're going to try in the next um, four, 50 minutes, actually. We've allowed ourselves uh, 50 minutes, so if you can uh, bear that, uh, to bring to life um, some ideas uh, that we're working with in the Commission uh, that are evolving as we work with them. So no better place to ventilate those ideas than um, an, an, an esteemed academic institution, uh, uh, Anna Chapman's institution, uh, and one where we've got an audience which is clearly a mix, although these days it's a little difficult to tell the difference between students and, um, and workplace relations practitioners uh, of either a union uh, employee representative or um, employer representative type. Everybody's so beautifully attired. Um, I went to university nearly 40 years ago, which is a really scary to say, and uh, you would have been able to tell the difference. Uh, and my son will be coming into the room later uh, because he uh, lives in Melbourne and we're having dinner together and he looks like the kind of university student I expected to see here tonight. <laughs> so you'll know him when he comes in with that introduction. <laughs> so thank you all so much for being here. As you can see from um, our slide up here on the screen, uh, we're going to talk about new approaches. Um, and uh, New Approaches um, has uh, the subtitle Cooperative and Productive Workplaces for the fairly obvious reason uh, that in 2013 the Fair Work Commission was given a new function by the Fair Work Act and it is uh, section 5762AA as you can see on your screen, promoting cooperative and productive workplace relations and preventing disputes. And for those of you who know um, the Fair Work Act, all of its 800 sections, I think that's right, someone will correct me if I'm wrong, Julius no doubt, um, uh, later, very politely, uh, but I think it's 800. Uh, it's a very big act and of course it doesn't only give functions to the Fair Work Commission, it gives functions to the uh, Federal uh, Court Fair Work Division uh, and uh, possibly other institutions that I can't think of. Uh, certainly the, uh, perhaps of course the Fair Work Ombudsman uh, would, uh, would be another obvious um, member of the Fair Work family as it was once um, described uh, by a former Prime Minister. Uh, so um, functions of the Fair Work Act are quite practical. Um, in fact, in that section 576, you'll see a whole list of things that you're familiar with, annual wage reviews, modern award reviews, and so on. Uh, so to give us a function of promoting cooperative and productive workplace relations or, or and preventing disputes, of course, in some senses is a, um, is a, a tilt back uh, to our past and our origin. Um, Again, those of you who are, the, who are studying the subject will no doubt be introduced to um, Section 5135 of the Constitution and the Conciliation and Arbitration Power and know that uh, the Prevention and Settlement of Industrial Disputes uh, is a core um, head of power under which the former legislation um, was grounded no longer. It's the corporation's power. Um, so it's not as though we're strangers um, to the Prevention and Settlement of Disputes as a function. But we've, and, and although the Act itself has spoken about objectives and in various different parts of the Act which deal with different jurisdictions, you will see mention of, of cooperative and productive workplaces. There's never been a function like this. Now, we could have, um, as um, a, a group of people who are the current custodians um, of, the, uh, of the expression um, of the Act, and as you know from your undoubt studies, undoubted studies and also uh, just reading the newspaper, we, we, we turn over. Um, Julius is about to turn over, which is very sad for all of us. <laughs> More information than you probably uh, wished to be revealed, but uh, uh, we, ca we can't uh, perform our function now as members beyond the age of 65, and you wouldn't believe it, but Julius is uh, <laughs> close to that. I think he doesn't look a day over 50 myself. But. <laughs> uh, so we, um, you know, we could have, as a group of members, just left that function there and said, well, you know, that's what we do. That's what we do. We promote cooperative and productive workplaces and we prevent disputes, nothing new to be seen here. But in fact, what uh, under the leadership um, of our president we decided to do 
uh, was to move to a new role for the Commission, which is not to say that we have abandoned um, our other territory, not in any way, shape or form have we done that. We, in fact, have added territory, and you'd be familiar with the anti-bullying jurisdiction, which next to the new approaches jurisdiction is the, the latest uh, jurisdiction to be added. Uh, but you'll also be aware that the Fair Work Act um, has within it uh, the unfair dismissals, the general protections, generally disputes, um, bargaining and so on. So there's a whole lot of stuff that we do. Um, but we decided to create a new jurisdiction or, or program, if you like, um, that gave life, um, that breathed life into this new function in a very practical way with a series of new interventions um, that hark back to our basic skill set of conciliation and arbitration but are applied in settings that are more holistic and more um, uh, proactive than the responsive um, um, dispute resolution um, role that we have had before. So let's just take a look at them and let me say a little bit about each of them. So I just want to turn your attention to the mo for the moment to actually what's underneath the words in bold. So um, in italics um, there are a range of what you might recognise as processes. So that's what we do. We are responsible for processes in the Fair Work Commission. Um, never before have we really embarked upon training as a process in a um, deliberate uh, sort of formulaic way. Uh, we, you might say that when you came before the Fair Work Commission um, in any jurisdiction, we might give, try and give you a little bit of training. In fact, if you've read an unfair dismissal decision lately, you'll see that there's quite a bit of advice uh, in there. Um, but actually conducting training, you know, where you have a training day and you have sessions and you have training objectives and you have exercises, that's not something we've done before. Um, facilitation is really at the, um, the less interventionist end of conciliation. So if you think about a, a continuum of interventions with, with uh, judicial, you know, judicial determination, which of course you'll know we don't do, um, at one end, and then arbitral determination very close to that, that is decisions from the Commission based on submissions that are put by parties, and then you sort of edge back towards the less um, determinative style of process to conciliation. Um, in the mix of all of that, you've got recommendations and opinions, which is a process we can use for dispute resolution. Well, sort of up this end, um, we've got facilitation, which will be more familiar, I think, to people who have been involved in mediation um, than uh, workplace relations, so the alternative dispute resolution processes that are part of uh, often um, restorative justice or um, family law or even commercial um, settlements for that matter. Um, and so facilitation is very much about um, guiding parties in a process rather than giving them um, answers. Um, you'll also see advice written there underneath the dispute prevention and resolution heading um, and that's something that as I said you might get a little bit of advice from time to time in an unfair dismissal decision um, but underneath the uh, new approaches jurisdiction you know we have given ourselves uh, uh, a full reign um, expressing the, uh, the, the powers that we have in our Act um, to provide opinion um, to parties in circumstances where they're working together um, in the ways that I'm about to talk about. Um, and I guess the last thing there that might appear a little bit um, out of the blue um, is coaching. Um, now, I use the term coaching in the broad sense. Um, I don't mean uh, that we have a program whereby you can buy 10 sessions and, uh, and come uh, to my chambers, uh, although we have had a few coaching sessions, haven't we, Kim and Angus? But uh, what I mean by coaching is a goal-setting activity. So again, those of you who are familiar with the coaching methodologies will know that it's about um, it's a, it's a solution-seeking conversation about identifying goals, identifying where a person is, where they want to be, and what steps are they going to take to get there. Well, that's what we do when it comes to parties. And the three um, um, statements or sets of words in bold, enterprise bargaining, dispute prevention and resolution, and workplace change are really the three domains in which we are largely involved. And we're involved in those domains in a way that, um, in some ways, um, uh, 
is um, a reflection of what we've always done, but is also a, a little different in that we tend to get involved earlier and for longer, so there's a time dimension. In terms of um, the, the issues, they tend to be a broader set of issues, not simply the narrow industrial issues that might um, be considered to be permitted matters, which is not to say that we encourage parties to have non-permitted matters in enterprise agreements, but we do encourage parties to have dialogue about all the things that are, in, are of interest to both of them. Um, so longer, broader, and deeper, so we get more intimately involved in the lives um, of our parties, sometimes more than they'd like, uh, and and are available in odd at odd times of the day and night, uh, and at uh, you know at a with a fairly informal um, uh, you know, initiative. So you know matters before the Commission, those of you who are practitioners would be familiar with completing a form and uh, waiting to be advised in writing when your listing is, well, under a new approaches um, file, we have parties just lift the phone or send a quick email or a text and say, can we have a chat? And the other thing that's different is that we have a protocol that is agreed between parties at the outset that says, Unlike um, a contested matter where you're going to make a decision, if there's if one party wants to have a chat, then the other party understands that that's a good thing to do, which kind of introduces the idea of trust, which I will come to. Um, so I just wanted to um, quickly cover what I think are fundamental kind of foundations um, of new approaches. Um, and um, I do this because usually we're talking about the methodology of interest-based bargaining, as Julius foreshadowed, and you'll get a little bit of that, I think, from me and from particularly from Kim and Angus. But I really wanted to throw a few ideas out because we're in an academic institution, so I don't want to just be here um, giving you information and promoting um, a new jurisdiction that the Fair Work Commission is uh, has embarked upon. We want to particularly in our panel session facilitated by Anna to, to engage with you about the ideas and be challenged um, about the ideas. As I said, it's evolving. So it does encourage an interest-based approach. An interest-based approach is not only about bargaining, um, but it is um, about agreement reaching, um, and that can, uh, that can be in a range of different contexts. And, and really the, the key distinction between an interest-based approach and your more traditional, uh, what we would call positional or claims-based or offer-counter-offer kind of approach, or simply, I have a dispute and I want this, this is, this is the outcome that I want, so an outcomes-oriented um, approach is to say, um, encourage people to articulate, to put language around their underlying needs and concerns, the things that really motivate them, um, and to encourage them to listen to each other, to hear the other person or the other parties, and it could be more than one, and in fact this whole area of the interest-based approach is, um, is huge in international relations and in um, stakeholder relations, in environmental dispute resolution, and you can see once you start working with it, how it's unlimited the number of stakeholders whose interests you can identify, and so critical that you do, and in industrial relations even that you do so um, for those who aren't there. So for example, in it will become apparent with Angus and Kim speaking that the interests of the people um, who are supported by the House with No Steps, the customers of the House with No Steps, are a critical set of interests for the parties to take into account in their work together and indeed arguably if they don't take those interests into account and work with those interests in the solutions that they um, go, that, that they seek, um, they're, they're not going to, to get the enduring solutions that come from taking an interest-based approach. A pluralist perspective is, is uh, those of you who are familiar with philosophy, it will be familiar with, is to say that the world is not one big happy family. Oh goodness, what a surprise. You would have thought it was looking around, wouldn't you? And it's not just because people are grumpy and, and selfish, it's because there are competing interests. There really are competing interests. So we do, um, in, a work in the workplace, um, you know, there are uh, an obvious one uh, that, that comes up all the time in workplace in hours of work is, you know, there is a competing interest with reliable and predictable hours of work so that people can have a life outside of work and sometimes the, the interests of the organisation to respond to the needs of customers who are unpredictable 
flexible and volatile and want their needs met when they want their needs met and, and the um, corresponding interest in um, obtaining work and therefore um, revenue, which you can then carefully manage to turn into um, most modest and reasonable surplus so that you can remain in business. So, a pluralist perspective is one that we regard as the reality of the world and we're unashamed about um, asserting that. Information sharing is um, critical. Julius mentioned this. It's about having a common evidence base for, for evidence-based decision making rather than um, uh, either withholding information and information being a weapon or eking out um, information uh, at a time when it's not able to be properly taken into account or indeed independently verified and then finding that people don't accept it um, as information but regard it as rhetoric or opinion and therefore won't work with it so that you don't get evidence-based dialogue, you get um, emotional and positionally based dialogue, ideological even. Um, and it urges problem solving um, about opportunities and adversity. Good point to make there is that not all problems involve adversity. Not all problems are negative. There are lots of problems that we want to solve that when opportunities come up. And so part of uh, the interest-based approach is for parties to work together to see how they can take advantage of opportunities, but also not having an adverse impact on the interests of those um, who are involved. Collaborative co-design goes with that. And fundamentally, it's about fostering trust between managers, workers and their unions. And what I mean by trust is the beliefs and the assumptions and expectations um, that we all have about one another. So it isn't easy, um, if you'll think about this for a moment, it's not easy to trust someone you don't know. How do you trust someone you don't know? So generally what you'll do uh, is you'll ask some questions about you know, what, what their role is, what their, um, where they come from. You might ask somebody else if they know them. Um, when you do know someone, it's also possible not to trust them. In fact, the world's troubles um, could pretty well be um, encapsulated as, a, as being as a result of that. Um, so trust is about having a relationship with somebody where you have you, you, you're fairly certain that you know how they'll respond to something or at least you can rely upon their, their good faith and uh, you can be fairly confident that if they say something that they truly believe it, uh, it may not be right of course and that's where independent verification comes in, um, but it's not meant with ill will, they're not trying to bring you down. Um, lack of trust, uh, which exists in a lot of Australian workplaces that uh, we work with, that Julius and I uh, work with on a daily basis, it comes um, from a deep set belief, an absolutely deeply held belief, which is funnily enough um, fulfilled uh, in its, uh, its veracity through it being believed, if that makes sense, it's circular, um, that the other side is, uh, is going to do something that is adverse to your interests and that you therefore need to be protect yourself against that. I just wanted to touch on these three areas and give you a little example perhaps of how that's come up for me in the new approaches files that I've been working on because you don't get in the Fair Work Commission to really sit down with parties for a long time and kind of go through their history and understand what things have happened in their history or understand their views of the world, um, even their ideologies and philosophies, unless you spend time with them. So in your approaches we get to do that and we encourage that discussion between the parties so that they actually do talk about their ideological inclinations um, and that's entirely valid and they talk about why those ideological in inclinations exist and they exist because of their, obs their, own, their particular observations of the interests of the constituents that they serve and then you ask them of course to think about the others um, uh, um, interests and the constituents they serve and then work together to try to come to solutions that meet all of those interests. But in enterprise bargaining, I observe, because I do Section 240 matters all the time, uh, where we just get an application that bargaining might have been occurring for a year and at, at 
and we get a, a, a what is called a bargaining dispute, um, and so you pop, you pop, you, you walk into a room of 25 people screaming at each other. You've, n you've never met them before. You don't. You, you you might have been able to have you know um, half an hour with the file in order to uh, look into the the history of the particular industry, but you don't really know what's gone on in the bargaining. And what you observe is a group of people trying to protect their interests. And the way they do that is by trying to make sure that everything, you wouldn't know it sometimes when you're interpreting agreements, by the way, but everything is written down. Absolutely everything is written down. And everything can be enforced in a court of law. And it leaves nothing to the imagination. Therefore, correspondingly, nothing uh, can be easily um, adjusted um, if circumstances change. So when I put the, the, uh, the statement there, economic value is created by an organisation's response to opportunity and adversity, that's an assertion. You may cavil with that. Uh, but the idea there is to say that if we're going to be a country where um, growth, economic growth can occur, um, and then we need to look at our, our political system um, to um, to um, be satisfied about the way in which um, the as well as our industrial relations system because that's also part of distribution to see how that the benefits um, of that economic growth are shared but we know um, that, uh, that that it is it is much more difficult um, to uh, to deal with distributional questions when growth um, is either um, absent or worse, negative, and that's true of a company as much as a country. So if economic value is created by an organisation's response to opportunity and adversity, and that's whether you're a not-for-profit like the House with no steps or a profitable company, then if you're in an enterprise bargaining situation and you create for three to four years a locked down, cannot be changed, no one will truck any um, alteration, then you do have less opportunity to, um, to, to be flexible. And if trust is what is needed to allow for adjustment during the, the period of an agreement, then that is only available um, when there's a high trust environment because, um, because workers and the, those who represent them will not agree uh, to terms that are open to change um, unless they're confident that those who are going to participate in that change conversation um, have their interests at heart. So that's one example. Information sharing is another. Um, we get lots and lots of uh, circumstances where there uh, is a refusal to um, share information and it's so counterproductive because if you don't have the same basis um, of understanding a particular problem, how can you participate equally in solving it? Um, and yet so often um, there is a reluctance uh, to share information and it's put on the basis that we don't trust the other side to keep that information confidential or we don't trust the other side to not misuse or misrepresent that information. And in consultation um, we find that we are dealing, Julius writes terrific decisions on this topic and we all get really tired of writing them by the way and over and over this you know this 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 issue emerged in you know february of 2016 and it wasn't until july of 2016 that a decision was made and the it was announced and then there was a period of two weeks for consultation uh, and uh, whilst it might strictly speaking meet the letter um, of the relevant provisions of the award or the agreement it just doesn't allow people to engage with the ideas and it's certainly not um, as you will see with the House with No Steps, consultation um, about problems. It's consultation about solutions, how they impact people, and it's generally what uh, the um, CEO of Sydney Water called announce and defend. So it's really about um, about um, spent, uh, 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 you know about getting to the point of the announcement of the decision and having a, a short period of time to have a statutorily def defensible period of consultation, and in so doing, of course, it's designed to allow for speedy implementation. Why is that? A, a, why why is that behaviour? occur because there isn't trust that if early consultation occurred there would be a responsible um, and constructive engagement um, with a genuine interest in meeting the needs of the organisation as well as the needs of those who might fear the consequences of that change upon themselves. So that's just three areas where I really do think trust um, has economic value. I think it's currency um, and I do think that it's you actually can build it. 
It isn't as esoteric or as, as, um, as amorphous as it might seem at first blush. You know, trust is built by making commitments and keeping them, and they can be tiny little wincy teensy ones. And we always say in interest-based bargaining that uh, process um, commitments made early and kept build trust. And so it, you're always working with that. It's, as Julia said, not blind trust. And um, one of our academic um, advisors, who um, I'm going to incur the wrath of the academics in the room, I've just realised, uh, but he's, I'm sure you would accept that he's a, an international expert on this area and, and he's actually a consultant to the University of Sydney and it was via the University of Sydney that he consulted to us. So I'm busy um, busy making uh, making it sound better. But anyway, we have a professor called Joel Kutcher-Goschenfeld. He's a, a currently was with uh, um, MIT and uh, and then the University of Illinois. He's now with Brandeis University in the US, but he consults, as I said, and acts as an um, associate. Uh, what, are you, what are those visiting professors? That's what it is. Sorry, Anna, you know all this stuff. Uh, and, and he's advised us, and he always says, this is terribly academic, he says the, the Middle Eastern people have a great saying. They say, trust in Allah, but tie up your camel. So, of course, those people who, tr people who trust one another will also understand that there are competing interests and will understand about verifying um, information and being able to independently analyse your interests. But that's different from, uh, from a situation where you just completely, um, you know, you, you operate in parallel universes and only come together for the train wreck, which is, you know, sometimes our experience. So lastly, this is just a little picture that uh, tries to portray um, where we're trying to move organisations from one place to another. And it's easy for us to say. I mean, we're just the Fair Work Commission where we, we, uh, we have to admit that it's, uh, it's the parties like the ASU um, with the, who Angus represents and the House With No Steps that Kim represents who are doing the hard work. We're actually just creating a bit of space and a few ideas. Um, but I think it's fair to say that my job also, to, for one more minute, was to set up really the, um, uh, the, the information you're going to hear from um, Kim and Angus. Um, I first um, came across the House With No Steps in late 2014 when they had a massive dispute in New South Wales. Not when I say massive, it's not one that you'd have heard of really, it wasn't waterfront. Um, but uh, it was pretty ugly and for them um, a big shock uh, and it was about a restructure. And it was an announce and defend situation and they, to their credit, having been through that dispute and resolved it in a traditional way and not a way that was particularly uh, a, a particularly interest meeting or, 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 or mutual gain outcome because I think it was somewhat to be fair, and Kim wasn't there at the time, but I know if Andrew Richardson, the chief executive of House With No Steps, was here, he would be nodding to say that it was an expedient resolution. And then having had that dispute and the expedient resolution, they looked at um, the situation along with ASU and, and said, is there something else we could do so we, we don't go through this process again? And, and from, nine, from 2014 onwards, they have been doing that. And you're going to hear um, about that tonight. So I think it would be fair to say that if you look at the dark blue circle, the sort of superficial consultation is where they probably were back in 2014. And you will hear Kim say that that was upon reflection out of alignment with their values. And they've been increasing the value of their engagement and really all their work has been in that top orange um, circle of rich consultation using collaborative problem solving. And that of itself has built trust. Um, and I will say no more because I don't want to assume too much, but um, that is the presentation that you're going to hear tonight. So, Okay, well, many thanks, Anna, and thank you, Anna, for the opportunity to be here this evening. I'm going to start with just setting the scene um, about um, House With No Steps and then I'm going to move on and talk about the uh, elements that make up our interest-based approach and summarise with what I believe are the essential conditions to make true collaboration work. And after Angus has spoken, I'll come back up here and talk about the specifics of our case study. So House With No Steps, uh, we're a disability services provider uh, and for 55 years we've had a single purpose and that's to help people with a disability 
to live a great life. We hold up the human rights of people with a disability and we currently do that for over 3,000 people in the eastern states of Australia. Now uh, we're going to see a quick 40 second um, campaign from last year which just gives you a bit of a flavour of what we I really like the strawberries in the garden because they're very juicy and very sweet. I love my friends. I love go on the shades. I am happy. I'm enjoying myself. It makes me so proud to see him so happy. I think he feels like he's flying. I love working outside in the fresh air and wide open spaces. I love baking. I love using colourful things to make it look beautiful. I love everyone to enjoy my cupcakes. For a life with no steps, visit hwns.com.au. OK, so um, we operate in uh, six key service areas. And next, um, next budget year, 64% of our revenue will be from supported living. And this is where we support people with disabilities to live in accommodation in the community. In the area of employment support, uh, we provide skills to help people move into the workforce. And we also directly provide employment to over 500 people working in our social enterprises. So that's on farms and hospitality, recycling, laundry businesses, and biscuit manufacture. House with No Steps operates across uh, the eastern seaboard and in fact we've just expanded into Victoria. We've acquired a business called Interchange Northern. Some of you may have heard of them. Uh, ICM provide family respite and social opportunities for children and young people with a disability. And this year we were successful in the devolution of the New South Wales State Disability Services. And we're in the process of planning for the transition of a thousand state employees, which will take effect on the 6th of October. And so by the end of the year, we'll employ close to 4,000 people and we'll support an addi additional 600 customers. Now, for us, um, the NDIS is a magnificent reform and it will make a substantial difference to people with a disability their families and the community at large. However, it brings with it significant workforce and organisational challenges. And it's in this turbulent and uncertain environment where the drive to commoditise labour and replace permanent work with casual work. Against this background, we have made a decision to invest in our permanent workforce and to continue to offer secure jobs, career paths, high quality training and family friendly work. But we face considerable challenges to do this and we need to change our business model. In this environment we have been working collaboratively with our union partners, the ASU in New South Wales and the Services Union in Queensland. And together what we want to do is to set an example for our sector for the employment of people and provide a model of collaborative working. We do believe our decisions will be better and the process of working through them will better our relationships. But the interest-based approach takes time and it is immersive. It's about a changed mindset and building up a web of collaborative connections. Moving to the interest-based approach didn't happen overnight. Joint training and communication sessions at a local level were facilitated by DP Booth. Over a period of two years, Anna uh, travelled the length and breadth of our business, facilitating sessions with our line managers and supervisors throughout New South Wales and Queensland, setting out what the interest-based approach comprised of, running through case studies and identifying areas where we might use the approach. Each of these sessions was attended by local management and supervisors 
and senior personnel. And our CEO attended every single one of those sessions. And those sessions role modelled our commitment, developed understanding of the approach and ensured that engagement was embedded at a local <coughs> level. Now we strive to use the interest-based approach for any problem policy or practice change. In our sector, the approach to rostering can be explosive, can generate grievances over roster changes, concerns around fairness, issues over how our EA is interpreted. Now, the interest-based approach was used to develop our guidelines, our rostering guidelines, three years ago. And we have just updated them as part of a move to a new rostering and time and attendance system. But the levels of trust on both sides have meant that this process was much less time consuming and intensive than previously. There was recognition and acceptance of the areas that needed to be definitive and enforceable. But in non-critical areas, trust allowed for some flexibility. Language which previously might have caused a disagreement was accepted. We have joint leadership meetings three times a year. House with No Steps members at these meetings include the CEO, our two senior business executives and myself. Angus attends as Assistant Secretary of the ASU in New South Wales. The Assistant Secretary of the Services Union attends and a handful of organisers and delegates. These meetings are not management meetings. We do not set the agenda. Chairmanship alternates between the three organisations. The meetings are an opportunity to come together and openly discuss strategic issues, M&A activity, government policy, and areas where we might collaborate or support each other. We had a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and on that agenda, for example, we talked openly about the transfer of the state disability services in New South Wales, discussion of possible acquisition targets, the recent announcement of the Victorian devolution exercise, our fit for purpose organisation restructure, submissions to the Productivity Commission, ASU lobbying in Canberra, and the ASU We Won't Wait campaign. It was a very full agenda. And the items on the agenda are those which might be on the agenda of an executive team meeting. We don't hold back or edit or hide the strategic issues we're dealing with as an organisation. But I have to say, it does rely on a very high degree of trust and an absolute commitment to confidentiality. Continuous sharing of information happens naturally. There are multiple examples of heads up type discussions. The ASU has a high quality policy team and is ahead of the curve when it comes to policy announcements or political issues. And on the other hand, we are able to provide practical insight in terms of what is happening on the ground. Mutual support and resource sharing occurs frequently. An example of this is the ASU high priority campaign to address domestic violence. We won't wait. The ASU will be rolling this out as part of enterprise bargaining. But they have asked House With No Steps to play a leadership role in this and adopt it ahead of our EA negotiation. Now, a traditional reaction might be, well, no way, we're going to lose a bargaining advantage. A joint interest-based approach recognising recognises that House With No Steps will become a more attractive employer by adopting this, that the majority of our employees are female, and for the ASU, they can utilise House With No Steps as a positive role model to other employers in the sector. Finally, early consultation about change. In fact, it's consultation before we even know what the change is. It's consultation about conundrums and problems. And we'll be covering that off in the next segment. But before I hand over to Angus, 
I want to run through uh, my reflections on how to make this approach work. Firstly, senior leadership commitment. And that's a genuine commitment, backed up by resource and time, and not just dwelling in one person. So it's not subject to fragility as people change roles. Collective memory of a bitter dispute. Now, happily, that's not a necessary condition, but there must be a desire to avoid disputes, not an acceptance that they are an inevitable outcome of workplace relations. Separation of the day-to-day -day matters, so robust joint consultative arrangements for day-to-day -day issues, different personnel dealing with issues on the ground. Mutual but frank facilitation from the Commission, and Anna's referred to this as coaching. In fact, um, Angus and I attend on a regular basis Anna's tea parties, <laughs> normally in the afternoon, where over a very good cup of, I think, Pakistan, Bangladeshi tea recently. Uh, and delicious biscuits, we're able to speak in a safe and neutral space about our concerns with, uh, if we have concerns with, with the process. Um, so capability building in the organisation. So investment from the commissioner, from the commission and us as the employer in training line managers. HR, me reminding line managers of our investment in this approach, uh, recruiting HR managers that share this mindset. A multiple engagement and discussion, so a drive to generate more areas of common interest, not less. Explicit rules of engagement. What is management prerogative? Articulating fears honestly, an approach for what to do if something goes wrong. Time and resource, allowing sufficient time to explore problems and to develop solutions. To allow time and space to create convergence. To resist management temptation to make decisions too quickly. Holding each party account being honest about how it's working, where there are issues, re reinforcing the good and providing positive feedback. And finally, a different mindset and behaviours. Rather long list, but respect, courage, restraint, trust, humility, honesty, forgiveness, and humour. And on that ambitious list of traits, I'll hand over to Angus, who impersonifies them. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, I might start by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, so my name's Angus McFarland. I'm an Assistant Secretary of the ASU in New South Wales and ACT. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk now about some of the the perspective of, I guess, AS, the ASU, and in particular our members, as to why we would engage in such a process, which is something that we don't uh, normally do um, and uh, is not very common. Um, you know, it's, it, this is not the traditional way that unions operate. Um, uh, so the first thing from is that for us, this did come out of a pretty nasty dispute where our members were... Um, you know, did, didn't have a great time. And I think there was a bit of dispute fatigue and our members wanted to work more constructively and proactively with the organisation, um, not only in their interests, but also in the interests of the people they support, because that is the most fundamental, I think, value of our members is making sure that people with disability have quality, uh, high quality disability services at House With No Steps. So, it wasn't a decision of myself or our uh, branch secretary at the time. It was something that we actually spent, um, after House With No Steps did approach us about this, we spent up to six months, I think, having workplace meetings throughout the organisation where we spoke directly to our members and asked them what they thought about this and, and wanting to get involved. And it was overwhelmingly 
from that a decision of our members that they did want to have a closer working relationship with House With No Steps and one where they felt that their voice was valued and respected and they had the opportunity to contribute um, uh, proactively and in advance to ideas to how make the organisation a better place to work and a better um, provider of disability services. Firstly, uh, the collaborative process was a decision of our uh, members to engage in that. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the role of delegates and why that's very important to us in how we engage in the collaborative process with any um, employer. Being a um, democratic uh, organisation, our local workplace leaders or delegates uh, really drive um, how we interact and engage with an organisation at a local, regional or senior um, level. So a part of the collaborative model for us is also that our members value is that it does recognise um, the role of union delegates as independent um, uh, voice of the workforce uh, in, in their organisation. So, and that is something that uh, having uh, worked in uh, collaborative relationships in three different providers, um, large providers, one of which has failed, um, that was one of the key things that really just meant that, that it couldn't work because the employer was not prepared to actually recognise that there were a lot of uh, employees that were a part of the union that wanted to work through their union with their employer and elect independently their own representatives to do that. Um, so that is a really key part for us that, and we know that House With No Steps really values the role of union delegates across all of its workplaces and regions. Um, and of course it involves a lot of training of our delegates that um, Anna was involved in. Uh, so as Kim talked about the local management sessions, there were delegates at all of those from those regions who were sitting down and problem solving together, running through games of, of, uh, of interest-based bargaining and getting to know each other and then actually committing to how they were going to collaborate in an ongoing way in their region into the future. And some of them, for example, have the local regional manager will meet with the group of local delegates monthly or every six weeks to collaborate or talk about local issues for them. Um, so that was very important uh, as well. The next reason why collaborate, collaboration uh, appeals to our members and they, uh, at House With No Steps, um, value this process is that it allows us to be, as union members, proactive, not just reactive, in making the organisation more successful and a better place to work. So union members uh, at House With No Steps are really proud of their work. They want their organisation to succeed. They want people with disability to have uh, lead independent lives and have great outcomes. And a part of that is them being able to identify and raise things with the organisation in a proactive way that will do that. Not just that we come together as union members when we are talking to the organisation, reacting to something that the organisation has um, you know, proposed. So two, uh, a couple of examples of that is that the roster guidelines that Kim talked about were a huge endeavour that um, our members proactively wanted to pursue. Um, for those who work in the disability sector or the community sector, you'll know that rostering issues, disputes are huge. Um, and so our members really wanted um, that to be something they worked on proactively to come up with better guidelines for the company and uh, we now consider those best practice in the entire sector in the country. And uh, moving right along, the other uh, broader interest for ASU members in this model beyond House With No Steps is about, as Kim said, looking, uh, we want to champion uh, good and best practice in the disability sector. Um, Organisations are having to face a lot of change because of the NDIS, that's true. But for us, there's, you know, there's a high road and a low road. The low road is one of uh, casualisation. It is one of insecure work. Um, it is one really of ultimately poor outcome to people with disability. If that's how organisations choose to position themselves to respond to the NDIS. Of course, the high road, which we see House With No Steps taking, is one that values secure work, is one that values 
uh, career paths, uh, a decent safety net of conditions, um, and the independent voice of its um, workforce through their union. So lastly, before I go back to Kim for our particular case study, um, I will just uh, put down some of the challenges though that I have seen in this model that I think you need to be aware of. And as I said, I've, I've worked, there are three organisations where I've worked uh, in this model with two gone very well, one very bad. Uh, one of the big uh, challenges is, as Kim said, it does take time. So when you're wanting to collaborate proactively or reactively on something, um, the standard process really is about six to eight months. It's not a, oh, we want to consult on this, you know, ASU, can you get all your members together and come back with a view in two weeks? It's like, no, no, no. Six months minimum it takes for us to genuinely collaborate locally, regionally, and then at the leadership level. Um, it must be embedded locally. So while there are good relationships between the leaderships of our union, without understanding, training, and buy-in at a local level, um, it, between delegates and local managers, it won't be um, successful. Um, relationships can change and, and can be fragile, so you don't, when, uh, so that can be a real challenge for collaboration. So particularly if the leadership of either organisation changes, um, if it's not fully embedded in the culture of the membership and the organisation, you do have a risk on your hands. Uh, and lastly, and this is probably more from the, the union interest, is that where an employer wants to engage in this but perceives the union as a third party, um, it's just not going to work. And what I mean by that is that perceives that the union is me as, as some kind of consultant for them in consulting with their workforce. That's not what um, a union is and that's not why we engage in this. So we are driven by our members and our member engagement. Um, and there has to be fundamentally from a union perspective, recognition of the right to not just join a union, but be actively participating in it um, and elect your local workforce delegates to be your independent voice at work. Thanks. Okay, so now um, we're going to turn to our uh, case study on using the interest-based approach during change. So, um, as those of you working in the sector know, and I suppose m most people know, the NDIS is generating significant structural change in our sector. And we uh, had been flagging to the ASU during 2016, uh, certainly, um, the financial and business model challenges of transitioning to the NDIS whilst maintaining our mission commitment. And in December 2016, uh, our leadership meeting at the Services Union in Brisbane, we agreed that we had to tackle this emerging problem and obviously we needed to use the interest-based approach to do that. The problem being that our entire business model was no longer fit for purpose. That was mid-December, and by mid-January, I think, in fact, the third week of January, as soon as we could, as soon as people were back from holiday, we uh, formed and met a collaborative core working group made up of representatives of House With No Steps, the ASU and the Services Union, to work on the problem. And that meeting was really about working collaboratively in mixed teams, trying to explore what the problem was from our different perspectives and begin to create uh, an understanding of our different perspectives and trying to begin to identify where there might be areas of common interest. And, um, we went through uh, exercises of uh, look, thinking about what our hopes were be for the process, what our fears would be, what our expectations would be. And this slide just gives um, an example of one of the outputs which was 
setting out what were the risks of involved of, of setting out on this uh, journey. But at the end of the day, uh, in collaboration, we came to a restatement of the problem that everybody in the room agreed to, uh, reflecting the interests and perspectives in the room. So this statement of the problem, not management's earlier statement of the problem, was the one that is embedded in what we've been working on for the last five or six months. Now, we agreed that all parties needed to be intimately involved in the next stage, which was the gathering of feedback, consultation, conversations. But we agreed or came to the conclusion collaboratively that the ASU would take the substantive role in gathering that feedback and that information and that data. That House With No Steps would establish an email line for consultation, we'd lead the consultation with families and with our shared services, but all other consultation would be in the hands of the ASU. So what that meant in practice was the ASU and the services union would attend every team meeting over a two month period to directly gain feedback from our support workers. And those discussions would take place without our management in the room, without HR managers present. And so from the employer's perspective, this entire process is ridiculous. It would be an absolute no-no because the unions are going to use this as a recruitment exercise. The unions will stir up issues where they don't exist. The unions will edit the information they give back to us. The unions will collect names and addresses and use it to generate a mailing list. The unions will hold back information and use it against us. So those were the reasons that in a traditional situation an employer would not even consider that as an option. But we did. We were a little nervous. <laughs> uh, some of our senior management were more than a little nervous. They counselled against that. But there was a process of reminding the organisation, the management, that this is what we had committed to. This is what a collaborative process meant. And there were a few issues right at the beginning, right at the beginning, literally the first workshop that happened that had the potential to derail the entire approach. But because we'd already built up a level of trust and respect, we were able to work through that. Now, towards the end of the process, we had literally thousands of comments from our 2,000 employees. So it wasn't that information wasn't that management was now going to share the results of consultation with the ASU. We had to somehow collaboratively begin to analyse the data. Uh, so what we did, and I suppose we worked this out as we went along, it was an iterative process. Uh, the ASU gave us the raw data in Excel spreadsheets. Uh, HR staff completed a first level thematic analysis and in fact I had two um, new direct reports starting that day and I just put them in a room with some music <laughs> and some cake and I let them work through it. So we, we did that and then we came together for joint workshops to analyse and synthesise the information to begin to design new jobs and to consider new organisational structures. Uh, and the workshops were physically and emotionally 
collaborative. And I don't think if somebody had come into the room, you would have been easily able to identify who was management, who were delegates, who were union officials. We're working together in a genuine team environment, producing quite, quite high quality output. Uh, but we are now um, at a high risk stage in the process. As with No Steps has modelled six possible organisation structures. The work, the paper on those structures being completed the day after our last joint workshop. So that was about me also resisting the temptation to put something down on paper about what structures, what straw men might be until we'd had the very last joint workshop. And those straw men proposals were reduced to two options by our leadership team last Thursday. So Angus and I have been talking today about putting in another joint workshop to work through the remaining options. And after that, House With No Steps will make a decision. Immediately after that, we've scheduled in our leadership team meeting to discuss that decision and to refine it if necessary. And as, as we move towards, I suppose, the hard reality of an organisation restructure and our legal obligations, that we will need to continue to act in a collaborative and high trust way. But to summarise, uh, the benefits of using the joint interest-based approach are that we have undoubtedly come up with a better solution. Hearing early on the concerns of our workers and sitting with those concerns and issues over weeks, over months, and the process has undoubtedly contributed to our employees being engaged in, the, in, in finding solutions for the challenges that are facing us in our sector. When we had unexpected insights into parts of the organisation that were working extremely well, also to parts of the organisation that weren't working well, and I think all of that will contribute to better outcomes for our customers. Our line managers have grown in confidence about the benefits of collaboration. And over time there's been a convergence of thinking around possible solutions and ways forward. And I've no doubt that the eventual solution we implement will be implemented more smoothly and will be more sustainable. And all of these items generate economic value. And the increase in trust is something that will build and build. And to use a metaphor, the interest-based approach will go on to increase the interest on our principal investment of trust. Thank you. OK, so I'll talk just briefly on some of the reflections that um, I've had and our members have had on this process to date because I know that um, there's limited time left for questions and, and Kim and I would like to sort of open it up more to you asking us specific things you might want to know about our broad collaborative relationship or this particular project. But for us um, and our members, this is a really um, big deal because, you know, not just because of what it's going to be about in terms of a new way of working at the organisation, but also because this is actually where our collaborative relationships sort of started from a fallout in a similar kind of um, uh, from a, a previous restructure. So there are high um, um, interest and engagement in this and wanting to really use this new approach that we have uh, decided to do together, you know, for a good outcome for our members and the organisation and the people that uh, are supported. Uh, so a part of that was a very respectful and inclusive process, which House of No Steps have been um, very fantastic of. And, and Kim spoke about all the different steps I won't repeat now, where um, organisers from the union went out and ran a whole series of 
um, uh, team meetings across the company to ask questions and again not just being reactive but proactive how do you what do you like about your work what do you not like about your work what would you like to change if you had to change anything what ideas do you have for the organisation to be better at supporting people with disabilities to be more efficient in what it does and we did do those discussions in very distinct and different groups so we did take out managers and team leaders um, many of whom are also members um, and we had separate discussions with them about them in their in those roles from the uh, first second and third line up of management um, and brought all of that back together uh, to then our working group which is made up of delegates and um, senior management of the company but I think having a respectful and inclusive um, process has been important um, the other thing I think uh, just to share with you is some of the feedback so far is that it's clear that our members very much um, value, and this is not really a surprise to anyone, um, but the meaningful work they do day to day with their clients and the people they support. And that's why they're in the business that they're in. And that everything sort of excess of that, in particular administrative work, um, is just not of an interest and is burdensome. Um, and also that our members value training and development, career paths, mentoring um, and peer support and reflection time uh, is something that has come out very strongly. So these are all obviously things that are not, that will be, uh, we then explored in the workshops and really going back to our first sessions where we went through what our interests were, um, they're things that again our members share an interest with the organisation in. That is about having strong career paths, having secure work, um, having a really great commitment to training and development. Um, it was good to see that those interests that we flagged at our first workshops in January were coming through loud and clear from our members across the, and all staff across the organisation. So I might just stop there because I think that the reflections might be better to come out in some further questions and I want to give people some time to ask some questions. So thanks very much. Um, we have got some times for some discussion and questions. So lots of thoughtful. Thank you there. Uh, I point you alluded to that the new approach is objective is solely plural's but the evidence of her also it's funny that uh, you raised that because I was just thinking as I was speaking, I, when I mentioned competing interests, I, I don't think that's working, so I think you can hear me, can't you? Does everybody yeah. hear me? So of, of course there are common interests as well. So um, as I understand it, and I'm no theorist, but the unitarist perspective suggests that there are only common interests, whereas the pluralist perspective deals with competing interests but also acknowledges that there are common interests so when I said um, a little while ago you know that there's that you know a, a competing interest we come across a lot which funnily enough in the rostering um, guidelines was very present um, in House With No Steps is the desire for predictability and reliability in working hours and the need to be responsive and adaptable um, to um, customer needs um, but of course the common interest is for the service to be in House With No Steps is for the particularly in an NDIS environment, for the service to be available to um, people who are supported when they need it. And in any kind of um, business organisation, whether it's people or, or in, I do a lot of work on the waterfront, so ships, for example, vessels come in in a very um, unpredictable way and they have to be loaded and unloaded when they're there at the wharf, not, uh, not at a time necessarily of the choosing um, always of employees. So, but the common interest there is a viable and, and thriving organisations. So for the House With No Steps they want to be viable and thriving and attract even more customers from NDIS um, or from, from, uh, from the ranks of people with disability with NDIS packages and they'll do that um, by being a successful organisation. So common as well as competing. That's particularly the, the objective of dispute prevention in a proactive manner. Mm. As opposed to thinking disputes conflict is inevitable and we're going to arbitrate at some point Mm. That's right. That objective of dispute prevention. In my view, that's more, has that degree of terrorism also. 
So we're, we're fond of saying, it um, might sound a bit glib, but that conflict is inevitable. It's the way in which you manage it that matters. So if, you, if, if conflict always erupts in destructive, debilitating, um, undermining disputes and they just keep happening and happening, then you drive yourself further down, down, down in terms of the um, separation of parties and their lack of trust. Whereas if you, if you do lay the groundwork, um, as has been done in House with No Steps, um, where there, is, there are competing interests, so that is in itself conflict, but it's, it's managed by um, a, a collaborative interest-based way where each party recognises each other's interests. And the gentleman there. Uh, I'm interested in the question of uh, union density in the organisation and, and in particular if you have high union density I suppose I can see that the union can represent if you've got 90% density but in a huge number of workforces in Australia union density is very very low 10% less and I'm in the university sector it's, it's around 15% how does that work what about the do you have a huge number of other people who aren't union members? Does the union speak for people who aren't members? Because you talk about members a lot, yep. uh, appropriately, but what about people who are not members? Yep. So, uh, I think one of the interesting things about um, this compared to, I know, a lot of other new approaches files at the Fair Work Commission is it is uh, an industry where with, um, well, it's not high union density, but it's growing union density. So it's one of it's certainly a, a fastly growing unionised industry, um, disability, uh, the disability sector, and it's the fastest growing part of our membership nationally. In the, across the ASU is disability sector. So while we do not have uh, extremely high density, we have a very, we do have hundreds and hundreds of members, and it would be the highest density probably of any provider in the country. And our members are all committed to, um, you know, working together for, you know, as I said, good jobs and career paths and better outcomes for clients at the end of the day. In terms of the member non-member thing, um, I mean, our approach going into this was if we can't, as if, if members and delegates can't work um, constructively with the organisation, like that, that's the priority for us. Like how 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 we um, others are involved um, is, you know is secondary in the sense that um, it, we came from a, such a point of conflict and our members wanted to do something different. That being said, all of the meetings that we uh, attended were, it wasn't, you know, discriminated about who was or wasn't a member, um, could participate and have their say through their local um, delegate or through the surveys that we did, whether or not they were a, a, a member. Yeah, so we could have, um Siloed. You could have siloed the consultation or conversation approach. And we could have said, oh, well, actually, ASU, you can run the consultation with your members, but our employees are our own and we'll deal with that. But that is not consistent with what we're trying to do here. And look, from an employer's perspective, uh, the approach, you know, well, from both our perspectives, the approach is high risk. And one of the risks for us in this approach was that, um, you know, that it would be a recruitment exercise for the ASU, of course. Uh, but that we just agreed, Angus and I, we agreed some rules around that. So if employees who were not members, after the facilitation, saw the value of professional union representation and they felt they wanted to sign up, there was a process for doing that outside the facilitation meeting. So we just kind of recognised that that was, that was an ASU interest in the approach, which wasn't our interest, but we allowed that to sit alongside our interest which was getting the ASU your source to do those facilitations for us. So, mm. yeah. It's, it's a topic that comes up very often. Um, and as I do a, um, a, um, some work in the water, on the waterfront where there's very high union density. Um, and even there, um, interestingly, 
um, in some circumstances, no names of course, um, a manager will say, well, they're our employees. Um, and this is, I think, a great risk and um, a challenge um, for an integrative approach. You used the term the integrative approach. Um, because, um, of course, the employee is not owned by the employer and they're not owned by the institution called the union. They are their own self-actualising being who have chosen to be represented in some cases by a union and when they haven't chosen to be represented by a union it doesn't mean that they wish the employer to be their spokesperson. So we're working as we as we of course must do and want to do you know with our act and in our act we have um, in bargaining anyway um, employee um, bargaining representatives so we will we will facilitate negotiations with an employer representative or a number of them, individual employees who are representing either themselves or some of their colleagues and union officials who are the default bargaining representative for another group of employees and have everybody work together but with a number of principles. One principle being that there is, in a pluralist perspective, the worker, the individual employee, has an independent voice. Um, and if, if the employer isn't open to hearing that independent voice, then they're diminishing their own, the, the contribution that that independent voice can make to shaping the future of the organisation. And what I'm so impressed about with the House With No Steps is just how the CEO, um, uh, Andrew Richardson, um, has said on occasion, of course the ASU uh, would like to have more members what what uh, what organisation that's based on membership wouldn't want to have more members? So he, he hasn't considered that to be somehow illegitimate, but quite the opposite, uh, and is relaxed with it. So once you see that kind of attitude, you can sort of put it behind you as it's, that's not an issue. Let's get on with what it is that we're doing here, which is um, harnessing the brain power and the heart. Um, and soul of the workforce for the for the um, effort, you know, of the organisation. It's a absolutely uplifting, and unless I, in case I don't get a chance to say so uh, later, let me, you know, say how incredibly impressed I am with Angus and Kim, the way they work together, and the way this whole project is unfolding. Mm. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. I've got some practical questions. So first of all, I'm interested in which commission members are involved in this program, but also. Yes, so I'll give you a quick answer. Um, it's in a sense every member, but that's not entirely true because not ever, every member is as interested as every other member. So the president has said that it's very much a, consistent with the, uh, the consensual um, uh, uh, value, I suppose, or norm that's underpinning it. It's about a, a member saying they're interested and having, having particularly those members who have a mediation background and facilitative mediation in particular there. So I won't name them now because that wouldn't be appropriate, but, uh, uh, but, but uh, how, a, how a workplace or a set of workplace parties more appropriate approaches the Commission is simply go on the website. In fact, I also should have mentioned earlier that um, we have a fantastic administrative team um, involved in new approaches and I'm sorry to you that I didn't mention that before. So we have Kate Purcell here um, who leads the, the engagement team for the Commission and we have Lauren Mathers um, and we have Liz Leung and we have James um, Blaker and um, uh, Kate, Lauren, uh, Liz and James are part of our administrative team. So there's a, a new approaches website and you you, um, you can, I can ring up or you can, uh, you can use the web and you will get an initial first response from a member of Kate's team. Um, but it must be a joint approach. So we don't work with, a, with an employer to craft a new approaches file and then sort of bolt on you know, the, the workforce after that. We, we've got to have, it's got to come from a, a groundswell of desire uh, in the workplace for the employees, their union, and uh, where, where that's appropriate, and uh, the employer to work together. And then there is a genuinely natural limitation to what we can do. So, you know, we can put the time in that we can put the time in, and sometimes that's not as much time as perhaps it might appear that we have put in with House With No Steps. That came 
very much early in the process as a bit of a prototype and also a, a bit of a shared passion. I have a daughter with a disability, so I'm particularly, in, you know, I, I just um, I really uh, enjoyed working with House With No Steps and will continue to enjoy working with you. I think it's, and, and as, as Kim said, it's about sort of creating some models um, because there are also, that, you know, there's a lot that you can do on your own, but we're, we're certainly willing to be there, you know, at the outset to kick the process off. Ah, yes. Um, I just wanted to understand from the AAS perspective, how do you justify the time that it takes and the resources that it takes to bring up this kind of um, interest-based approach? Yeah, it is. Um, so it is a big resource um, for the union because we have, um, well, two organisers who have been for about two months full time doing running team meetings, the house in their steps. Um, but they but they are discussions with our members, and they it's something that our members very much value. And it is because also we do have throughout the process of um, collaboration over the last couple of years, we have grown a lot in our membership because our members do um, value having uh, that respect and recognition at work through an independent um, through having through their independent workplace delegates. Uh, having that voice um, and working proactively, constructively in the interests of the people they support. So uh, the more and more we have collaborated um, because you know, people have actually been joining the union. So it, it's not, um, it isn't something that we're that static, our, our membership. Um, look, I think in light of the time, we might need to leave it there. Um, but I think you'll agree with me, it's been a very interesting session and very insightful. So thank you, the three of you, for sharing so much uh, food for thought for us today. So would you join me in thanking? Thank you. Thank you so much.